stretch out your tents. Um, I think this is very much part of what God is directing us. We are very much, if you like, going on the waves of God in this next move. We feel God has really opened up something that actually we've been praying for for quite a number of years, but in the context of what Helen shared quite a while ago, I am doing a new thing. And actually what Jeremy reaffirmed when he brought um, his words some time ago too, God is doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? We're going to perceive it and we're going to faithfully follow Jesus over these coming years. Um, so good morning. Today we are in the last chapter, uh, cha uh, the last chapter of Ephesians as part of our sermon series, Dunamis, the power of God um, in the church, as uh, Jody just said there. And over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the section on how the gospel shapes our handling of relationships within the church and within the household. Households then were much different to our households uh, in that they had lots of um, lots more people, extended families, kids, kids of kids, servants and slaves and orphans. Uh, if you think of, if you think your household is complex, say a little prayer for their households. And so it is into this context that Paul is writing countercultural, shocking, hot potato stuff. Christianity, as theologians call it, is a contrast community so obviously different to the world around us that it brings restoration to ruin it opens people's eyes it brings hope to despair and all that is shaped by the joy news of Jesus not just what the world tells us this morning I'm actually gonna skip verses one to four about parent and child relationships and focus on verses seven to nine instead about slaves and masters which has resurged as a very 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 hot potato in our racially charged world especially after the murder of George Floyd over a year ago so I'm not what I'm not saying though is parenting and child relationships are not important so what I'm going to do is send out in the weekly roundup email some resources and talks about parenting so that you don't miss out, that you can maybe go through that section of Ephesians as a family together. So, okay, let's read from the passage from Ephesians, verse five. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, hear this, Treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, Jesus, and there is no favoritism with him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for scripture. Thank you, Lord, for all of scripture. Um, I thank you, Lord, for the bits of scripture that we sometimes find difficult, slaves and masters. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and help me this morning unpack your heart through your truth, your word. And I pray, Lord God, that where this might cause uh, difficulty amongst us, I pray, Lord, that the gospel comes out in all its truth and its wonder in how you are a God who comes to us in the midst of enslavement and sets us free. So I hope we have eyes to see that and ears to hear that this morning. In Jesus' name. So let's pause. What do you feel after hearing that? What are you thinking about? What are the questions that come to mind? If you're anything like me, your might be your mind might be wandering to one of the darkest moments of our history, the transatlantic slave trade of the 1500s to the 1800s, where just under 
13 million Africans were kidnapped and shipped across the Atlantic, experiencing inhuman conditions, two and a half mil million men, women and kids dying en route and millions more dying in the seasoning camps after arrival in the new world. Black church leader and abolitionist, that's someone who gives his life for outlawing the outlawing of the slave trade, uh, this abolitionist, James W.C. Pennington, penned these troubling thoughts when he asked the dangerous question in the 1800s. He said, does the Bible condemn slavery without any regard to circumstances or not? I, for one, desire to know. My repentance, my faith, my hope, my love, my perseverance, all, all, I conceal it not, I repeat it all turn upon this point. If I am deceived here, if the word of God does sanction slavery, I want another book, another repentance, another faith, and another hope. And so the question I want to look at today is, does the Bible condone slavery? Because many white slavers own, slave owners made it their mission to make their oppressed black slaves think that was so. This question is actually much a much bigger one about the character of God. Esau Macaulay, a graduate of the former Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright from St. Andrews in Scotland writes, on the first read, the Bible does not appear to say all that we want it to say in the way that we want the Bible to say it. And yet this is the crucial part. The Bible, friends, says more than enough. And ultimately his conclusion and my conclusion, which I want to work, well, I want us to work through today is that the story of Christianity does not on every page legislate slavery out of existence as culturally that would have been almost an impossible thing to do. Instead, the Christian narrative, the power and logic of the gospel, the dynamis, if you like, creates a world in which slavery becomes unimaginable, not just to God's people, but to everyone around. So let's start, shall we, at the beginning, the God who sees, that's where we're gonna, hit, we're gonna kick off in Genesis. The first slave described in the Bible is the girl Hagar, who Abraham sleeps with in order to overcome his wife's inability to have children, even after God promised, it, promised him generations. And you might be thinking, isn't that condoning slavery? Worse still, sex slavery. But actually, when we step back, and it's always important to do this, when we step back from Genesis 3, I would say 1 actually, but Genesis 3 onwards, the Bible describes what is culturally normal and practiced many centuries ago as human sin. And in many instances, it is clear that these are descriptions um, of even our Bible heroes dishonoring, disregarding, and disobeying God. In fact, they give us hope, actually, if he can use people like them, surely he can use people like us. In this story, we see that sleeping with Hagar is a clear defiance of God's will and a lack of faith on the part of Abraham and Sarah in God's promises. As a result, Sarah deals harshly with Hagar, if you remember the story, out of jealousy and kicks Hagar out. She flees the household, but then comes an extraordinary outpouring of grace from God to this slave girl when he declares over her almost the identical promise, I don't know if you noticed that, that he speaks over Abraham himself. I will increase your descendants so much that will, they will be too numerous to count. In fact, this poor used slave girl becomes the first person in the whole of scripture to name God. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Astonishing. We also must, must put slavery uh, the slavery of Abraham's time in context with the slavery that we often think of. Slavery was different 
then for three different reasons. Firstly, ancient slavery was not associated with racial differences and or brutal kidnapping usually. Secondly, it was common for people to sell themselves into slavery as, more, as almost a form of employment, as a way out of destitution or difficult times. Many people opted to be slaves. Thirdly, and sadly, despite ancient slavery still being often brutal and exploitative, in the long run, slaves often had the opportunity to better their lives. In fact, one notable example uh, of that in the Bible is Joseph, who was sold to slavery in Egypt, but ultimately becomes a senior uh, civil servant under Pharaoh. That said, you need to hear me crystal clear. I'm not saying, and the Bible is not saying, that there is a good slavery compared to a bad slavery. In fact, when we look at God's creation account and then move on right to the end in Revelation, the eternal life in God and with God, there isn't an, a hint of enslavement, bondage, or oppression. Slavery is bad, full stop. But it does present itself differently in different cultures. Probably the greatest narrative of all, declaring God's heart for men and women to be free from slavery is the Exodus story. As Moses encounters God in the burning bush, remember what God says to him? I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, says God. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Or as other translations put it, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. I know God knows their sufferings. This God who sees also hears, knows and feels. This enslaved people group become God's chosen instrument for kingdom change. And actually, um, um, through the law, a blueprint to how Israel should treat outsiders and those they saw as different from themselves. Deuteronomy 24, 17 says this, do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak off of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. Peter Craigie, once a theology student at Durham writes, Israel were to remember that when they had been slaves, God loved them, freed them, and made ample provision for them as sons of God. Also, God's law in the midst of cultural sin and the practice of slavery, once again on numerous accounts, lessens the blow of such oppression compared to, the, compared to how the world around them dealt with it in its banning of slave catching and its multiple laws uh, to protect slave welfare and oppression and its invitation to see the world through enslaved eyes. But the Old Testament does not ban slavery itself. So secondly, what about Paul, the writer of this letter? Because of passages that we've just read today, Paul is often presented to black Christians as the font of all our troubles. But just like you and me, Paul, I guess, was a human being in time, space, history, and context. It would seem that Paul doesn't believe that this small community of believers could change Roman law by revolt. In fact, when we take a step back and look at Paul's writings, in generally, very rarely, does he pray for God to take him out of all the, all the terrible situations he faces. What he seems to do instead is to come to the gospel of Christ and apply it in such a way that faith rises, strength and boldness to persevere grows, pointing to a future hope where all the sad things will ultimately come in true, come untrue, to imagine a world on the other side of slavery. 
He seems to be singing to himself and over us in the crushing, in the pressing. Jesus, bring new wine out of me and you. It may come as a surprise to you that the New Testament includes a letter written by the Apostle Paul to re return an escaped slave, Onesimus, to his master, Phil Philemon. When you hear that, you might think, well, that proves it, doesn't it? The Bible endorses slavery. There you go again. And actually, if you do think that, you clearly haven't read the letter. It's remarkably affectionate. It says this, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Paul is in a Roman prison. In Paul's day, slaves were not sons. They were property. He then goes on to say, I am sending back I'm sending him um, who is my very heart back to you. The affection he uses in this letter surpasses the affection of any other person he names in any other letter. But then comes the bigger blow. He pleads with uh, Philemon that he might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Why? Well, Paul says, because he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, Philemon, both as a fellow man created in the image of God and as a brother in the Lord, chosen, adopted, free, just like you, Philemon. Roman law would have allowed Philemon to seriously and violently discipline Onesimus for escaping. But Paul writes in such a way that Philemon doesn't welcome Anes uh, that uh, if Philemon doesn't welcome Onesimus back with honor and love as a beloved brother and uh, as a beloved brother and not as a slave, he would be going against his greatest Christian mentor. Paul. Listen, God is a God who sees the plight of his people and comes to them. God chose an enslaved people to be his instrument for change. God transformed the life of Paul so that he would be a model to other Christians to see how the gospel changes everything in a way unheard of, unprecedented for the times. Thirdly, we are all slaves of Christ. What was fascinating about the Martin Luther King Jr. civil rights movement um, was that so much of it was based on Christianity and the life of Jesus. However, that has changed. Today we see, today you see the wielding of power as the way forward. For instance, if one group is oppressing another group, the way to solve that problem is to give the oppressed group more power, whoever you are. However, Jesus turns away from that, thinking that the way, thinking that way of being totally on its head. He, his kingdom is a topsy-turvy kingdom where strengthening of power, upping of power is, um, is, it, it, is not how he uh, uh, works things out. Before Calgary, when the disciples were arguing about who is the most powerful, Jesus took on the form of a slave or a servant and washed their feet and told them to do likewise. He said, whoever would be great among you, you must be, uh, you must be your servant, they must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. He said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As Rebecca McLaughlin, theologian, points out, status in his kingdom lies at the bottom of the pile. And Paul understood this. It was clearly outrageous compared to the thinking of the day, especially when referring to the true Messiah. But that's what he did. Philippians 2, though he, Jesus, was God, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died as a crim died a criminal's death on a cross. Astonishing again. 
And so this becomes a slogan for Christians in the early church, doulos, bond servants, slaves of Christ, starting with those who would be considered at the very top, the apostles. Why so? Well, I think they wanted to communicate two things. Firstly, ultimate power to transform the world comes through weakness, a gospel imperative, the giving up of power. Paul says, I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. But secondly, this slave language communicated identity, the utter belonging to Christ. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Just as slaves live to do their master's work, Christians live to serve Christ, as Hannah said. Serving in the kingdom of God was not a subhuman responsibility, as they were serving as sons and daughters of the king. It communicated the supremacy of kingdom culture over all other cultural cultures and identities that we look to for importance and meaning. And if you think about it, hearing leaders refer to themselves as slaves of Christ must have been sweet to the ears of first century Christians in bondage and indeed the black slaves on plantations. You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes there is no longer Jew or Gentile slave or free male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus and now that you belong to Christ you are his heirs this Jesus inhabited the slave role Paul called himself a slave of Christ loves an escaped slave of his very own heart and insists that slave and free are equal in Christ. This intolerance of superiority, exploitation, power and coercion created a tension that would ultimately erupt in the abolition of slavery itself. Paul doesn't lay down the law and explicitly condemn slavery, but rather he declares the upside kingdom advancing gospel of God lives this out himself as a model of Christ-likeness in the midst of persecution and gets people to think and therefore act differently. In essence, cutting the very legs from under slavery itself. Or as Don Carson, theologian, puts it, in the midst of our abhorrence about slavery, you have to keep your eye on Jesus' mission. Essentially, he did not come to overturn the Roman economic system, which included slavery. I would say that of Paul, too. He came to free men and women from their sins. And here's my point, says Don Carson. What his message does is transform people so they begin to love God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength and to love their neighbor as themselves. Naturally, that has an impact on the idea of slavery and it did it sure did in in the fourth century Gregory of Night, uh, Nyssa uh, launched an attack on slavery that was unprecedented in the ancient world where slavery was taken for granted over the time of the Christianization of Europe slavery became effectively eliminated Saint Bathild, wife of King Clovis II of Burgundy, who had once been a slave herself, campaigned for the abolition of the contemporary slave trade and the freeing of all slaves. The ninth century Saint Anskar campaigned against Viking slavery, which was much more brutal. The 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas argued that slavery was a sin and the popes that followed agreed with this. Nonetheless, between 1562 and 1807, the horrific explosion of slavery crept back with a vengeance. And in the midst of all this, William Wilberforce, a devout Christian, believed he had been called by God to shipwreck the transatlantic slave trade. 
Indeed, indeed, William uh, William's passionate faith was seen as religious fanaticism. In fact, he once said, "If it to be feelingly alive to if it to be feelingly alive to the sufferings of my fellow creatures, if it seems to be feelingly alive to the sufferings of my fellow creatures, if that feels like fanaticism, then I am one of the most incurable fanatics." ever permitted to be at large. Harriet Tubman had been, told the, had been told Bible stories by her mother as a child and modeled her efforts to free slaves uh, on Moses's leading of the Israelites out of Egypt. In, um, in, in, and then she was nicknamed Moses by her contemporaries for her many secret missions to help slaves escape captivity. There's been a film about that recently, which was excellent. Sojourner Truth escaped slavery to become one of the most effective public speakers in the movement, despite her lack of education. Despite the misery of slaves and the abuse of the Bible and Christianity to perpetuate the continuation of slavery, what is phenomenal is how Jesus deeply penetrated these persecuted slave communities. Harriet Beecher Stowe's character, Uncle Tom, was inspired by a real guy, Josiah Henson. Henson was 18 years old before he heard the beauty of the gospel. He'd come from a slave background. But when he did, he was overcome with the gospel. He realized that the Son of God died for all the bond, the poor, the Negro in his change in his chains. Oh, the blessedness and sweetness of feeling that I was loved. I would have died that moment with joy and kept repeating to myself the compass compassionate saviour about whom I have heard loves me. Henson escaped slavery and went on to set up a refuge for escaped slaves in Canada and to become a Christian preacher himself. Listen, the transatlantic slave trade was a sinful scar on our history. We must never forget it. Worse still, alleged Christians supported this by slanderous use of the Bible. Sadly, this is still true today in many parts of the world. In fact, although slavery has been outlawed, it still exists even on the narrowest definition of slavery. It's still likely that there are far more, far more slaves now uh, than there, were, than there were victims of the Atlantic slave trade. We must feel the power of that statistic. However, what we really see in the Bible is that, a God, is that God's love extends to all. That enslavement to other fellow human beings is against God's will. In Paul's mind, slavery had to change like everything else and gradually, despite it being all too slow, Men and women like Wilberforce and Tubman and others lived out that gospel in courageous ways to bring about its end. This is how my good friend Owen, to end with, Owen Halton, Hilton, uh, who's one of the key people in our movement of churches in the UK, help us help, uh, is, uh, help, uh, helping us through all this uh, race and diversity. Um, opportunity. This is how he sees it. The church is at the forefront of reconciliation and bringing nations together to the point where others look on and come in order to find out for themselves what God is like. In this way, the church has a potential um, found nowhere else in society. No other religion or philosophy of life offers the same opportunity for unity in diversity as the church does, your church, my church. When nations come together across all sorts of barriers of history, race and stereotypes, the church does something no other group or society can dream of. But we don't only dream of it. God offers us in the church the opportunity to experience it because this is part of his great and glorious gospel. It may currently remain an untapped potential, but his people, you and me, are beginning to dream and act. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. <laughs>
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. In all this, let Christ be magnified.